Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hi there, and welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. This is episode number 156. Glad you could join us. A common dream sold to traders, especially when they're starting out, is this dream of sitting back on the beach, sipping cocktails, <laughs> while our trading systems go to work and make us all this money. Now, <laughs> while certain aspects of that dream are possible, for example, the automated trading side of it, traders still need to do a lot of work to even get to that point. We've got to research the markets, find trading edges, do the testing, the robustness checks, monitoring, tweaking, adjusting. You know, it's really not as simple as the dream sounds. But with recent advances in technology, including AI, machine learning and quantum computing, are we close to having fully autonomous trading systems? That is, systems that can they really learn trading rules by themselves, find profitable edges and trade them while we do sit back on the beach, boat or couch, sipping cocktails and counting our money. Well, in this podcast episode, we're going to explore how recent advances in technology are impacting the trading space now and where it could be taking us in the future. And to do that, we have special guest, Dr. Tom Stark from AAA Quants. Tom specializes in AI and machine learning solutions, and he's got some interesting insights to share with us on this episode. So let's get started now and jump over to my chat with Dr. Tom Stark. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the show. It's really great to have you here as a guest today. Thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to uh, be on your show. Thank you. We've got a lot of great stuff to chat about today, but before we do that, how about we just start with a bit of your background, um, if you want to share you know, some of your background and how you got started in the markets? All right. Um, well, I, I originally did a physics PhD, and then I worked uh, for quite a few years in engineering uh, from um working on jet engines and materials all the way to uh, semiconductor design. And uh, one day I had this crazy idea that I built myself a machine that trades on the stock market uh, while I'm lying on the beach. Um, and so I got started on this as a hobby. Um, and then, you know, as, as it goes, um, you know, be having a background in computer simulations, I had a decent success with this, with my own strategies, but, uh, you know, very quickly you realize when you have just a small amount of money, it's it's not that great. And so uh, I started working with hedge funds and some um, financial advisors and then moving on. Um, my last um, assignment before I started my own company was um, in Sydney at a prop trading firm called Vivian Court, uh, which is, by the way, quite interesting because they're actually a charity uh as much as a trading firm. So uh, quite a, a nice one to check out. Um, and um, yeah, basically now um, I'm working in my own company, Triple A Quants, um, you know, giving consultancy and, and running or, you know, um, helping companies to set up automated trading systems and so on. Yeah, yeah. And I understand as well, you do a lot of travel and speaking because you're currently in India, right? That's true. Yes. Hello from Delhi. Um, I'm currently uh, having a big tour through India, uh, running um, workshops uh, in um, in conjunction with Quantopian and also some meetups here in India. Um, uh, I have to say I love India. It's a very nice country. It's really interesting and really a lot of smart people here. It's it's a real pleasure to, to be here. And an adventure, of course. <laughs> yeah, and good food as well. Yes, yes. Uh, the food is just absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so getting back to trading then, you uh, it's funny that you mentioned that you had this dream of you know, a computer doing all the work for you and just sitting back on the beach. I think that's probably uh, something a lot of traders aspire to. But I think this whole idea of autonomous trading systems is really important or it's a really fascinating time for technology um, at the moment, especially with the rise of AI. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we're seeing a huge increase in the application of AI and machine learning in recent years in various fields. And I guess for trading, the holy grail is to have machines that trade autonomously, right? They control themselves. They find the edges. They bring home the money so you can sit on the beach and drink your cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it sounds like a good job for AI, but I'm sure there are a lot of smart people out there with huge budgets, hedge funds and things like that, that are working on these type of applications. Has anyone done it yet? Do you, are we there already? So, um, yeah, it's a very interesting question because I get this a lot when when I give my talks and so on. People ask, oh, well, you know, what's the state of this? Now, obviously, uh, people that um, that do have that technology already, they're, they're usually very quiet about it. Um, however, as far as, as I know uh, from, the, um, from the industry, no one has really built a fully autonomous system yet. It's actually uh, very difficult, and there's a few um, a few roadblocks uh, to that f- with the current technology that that I can we can talk about in a little bit. Um, so the the real the real holy grail of just having a machine that doesn't even need uh, any rules you you just switch it on and it starts trading and making money. I think in that in that perfect sense, it has not materialized yet. I don't think anyone is actually running a machine like that so far. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about this actually uh, the other day because, um, because uh, yeah, there, there is probably a lot of money and, and research going into this. And if a company has kind of figured it out a little bit, they're not really going to publish, publicize it, are they? Because, you know, it could be making them a, a lot of money in the markets and that kind of technology is very, um, you know, it's high in the IP. So you mentioned there are some challenges to achieving this. Do you want to share what some of those could be? Um, of course, of course. Well, there's, there's, there's really a few big ones. And, um, you know, when we talk about fully autonomous systems, we're actually talking about a technology that is based on uh, deep learning or neural networks, as it were. And the new technology is called reinforcement learning. And what that does is basically you don't you don't tell it, you don't give it any more um, um, some some training set that, that it can uh, be trained on. The, um, the reinforcement learner basically figures itself out uh, what to do uh, by giving it uh, what you call a reward function. So it has a set of, uh, of rules that are called policies of what it can do. In, in the case of trading, it's buy, sell, and hold, for example. And then you have a reward function, which in the simplest case, but not necessarily the most effective case, is the P&L of a trade. So um, that's... That's in a nutshell how this works. And then you, you switch on the machine and it, it starts doing random stuff and it gets rewards for what it's doing. And more and more as it goes along, it figures out in by itself uh, what is the actual best action to take given a certain state. And the state in that case is just uh, the state of the market at the current time. So what, what are the challenges with this? Uh, the, the first challenge is um, in trading, uh, the signal to noise ratio is extremely high, uh, sorry, extremely low, in fact. So we have a lot of noise um, and very little signal in, in uh, financial time series. Now imagine, um, for example, uh, if you use AI to do face recognition, and then you have a face which consists only of five pixels, and you try to recognize uh, who is the person behind those five pixels, it's pretty difficult. Not necessarily impossible, but very, very difficult. So um, in trading, we, we deal with this high noise all the time. Um, and then, of course, uh, a, a AI like this, a reinforcement learner, is what you call very simple, inefficient, meaning that you need a lot of uh, training or a, a lot of data, and it needs to run for a long time until it actually starts making decisions and that in itself is also a little bit of a problem because we um, have only a limited set of, of market data available and you could say well we have a, a large amount of products but usually uh, different products and different sectors perform differently so, so you can't just use the same AI uh, system um, for all products and all sectors alike you have to 
it has to run for a while, it has to learn. And so it's it's quite difficult to, to get enough data to train the AI system on. So that's basically um, the first point. And the second big point is that imagine when, when you trade in the market, you, you change the market, you mm. you move the market. So what that means is that a system that, that learns how the market performs and then it changes the market itself, that, that there is this feedback loop uh, upon itself basically so so you do this you change the market it's a bit like coming back to face recognition imagine you do face recognition on a person and then by doing that the person just gets older the face just suddenly looks older uh, which is obviously not <laughs> not the case but but this is <laughs> this is sort of uh, how how it works with those systems in the market and I'm not saying it's impossible to get them to run. Um, I have actually done a fair amount of research on this, but uh, these these are the main um, these are the main difficulties that we're facing when we're doing this. And in that sense, it's it's very different from um, a reinforcement learning um, you um, um, playing games such as chess. Or recently, uh, you know, one of these machines has beat the Go world champion uh, really strongly. Um, these, wh when you apply reinforcement learning to these games, the, the rules are not changed. The rules stay the same, but this is different in trading. You, you apply those machines and the rules of the market change to some extent. And so, so it's quite different. Yeah, I, was, um, I actually uh, just discovered this story about uh, this game go and AlphaGo uh, just recently, and uh, I think it was it's kind of fascinating the the way that it um, it came about and and what it was able to do. Can you kind of share a little bit more about that story and the implications it has for AI and um, I guess other industries in general? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, if you haven't seen the uh, documentary, there's a really great documentary about that on Netflix. Um, but uh, just in a nutshell, uh, um, this this company, um, um, I think it was called AlphaGo, it, uh, but initially it was called different DeepMind, I think it was, and then was acquired by Google and called AlphaGo, I think. And um, uh, they set out to uh, play Go which, Go, which is supposed to be the hardest game in the world. It's it's really popular in Korea. And they, with the help of, of a Go master in, in the UK, they trained uh, the machine originally, and then uh, once they were happy with that, they actually went into a, a world champion game against the uh, Go Master, the, the current uh, Go World Champion. And the, uh, in the documentary, interestingly, the Go World Champion was 100% sure he, he would just beat the computer without any problems. Um, and it turned out that it was the opposite. Uh, he only won one out of five games um and it, it was incredibly interesting to see uh he was he was very humbled but also in in awe about what he just experienced and um it, it was really fascinating to see him also how he dealt with this because he was un, unbeaten for hundreds of games no one could ever beat him and then this machine came along and did that um so um if you haven't seen this, it's 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 worth a, a, a view. Uh, the implications for this, of course, are very strong. In, in that, when when they built AlphaGo or the second iteration of it, it they actually didn't even um, give it any training data. It AlphaGo just worked out by itself uh, how to play the game and how to how to win, which which is fascinating. Um, now, as I said before, it's. It's it's a really amazing uh, tool for a lot of things uh, and can be applied, uh, but there, there is definitely a difference between um, cracking board games and, for example, dealing uh, with much much more irrational um, circumstances in the market. And uh, it's it's interesting. A lot uh, I've seen a lot of AI gurus coming into trading, thinking, "Oh, this is easy. We just." you know, use our amazing techniques to do it. And often they don't, um, they don't necessarily succeed. So, and, and, and in fact, a lot of the times 
they get quite frustrated um, because the markets are just not that simple. <laughs> yeah. There's there's humans behind it changing the rules of the game all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, what really impressed me about that AlphaGo project was that the second, uh, I don't know, the, the second research project, I guess you could call it, uh, where they basically just removed the constraints of human knowledge, right? They just let this machine go and learn by itself. I think that is, um, that's incredibly fascinating and maybe a little bit frightening depending on which way you look at it. But mm -hmm. um, you were just touching on a couple of key points there, I think, about AI gurus coming into the markets or into trading and, and making mistakes because, um, well, for a number of reasons. Can you uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more on where these AI gurus are getting it wrong? Perhaps what are they doing or how are they approaching it in the wrong way? Um, sure. Um, I think it's it's not so much that, that people approach it in the wrong way. Ob obviously, for everyone who enters the markets, it's a steep learning curve. And in trading, you also need quite a bit of domain-specific knowledge. Um, every uh, product you trade is even different. Um, the rules of trading are very specific and very different from uh, things like image recognition and, and something like that. So... Um, Often uh, it's it's easy to overlook little gotchas that that you can have, um, and so you know when when uh, those people come in the market, often they they try to predict uh, uh, prices, which is definitely not the right way to go. You you should really start predicting returns, if anything, because if you know if you predict the price just uh, almost correctly, but just slightly above or below, that means. Uh, you either win or lose money fifty percent of the time, um, which which is not not ideal. Um, the other thing is, and I have seen this uh, a few times in trading papers, um, when people write about AI in trading, they often completely forget the costs of trading, and that of course is is a huge problem. Um, there's a lot of amazing strategies that would just work if only you didn't have uh, any trading costs. So. Um, it's it's if if you haven't been in this before, then it's easy to forget that, and um, of course they also forget that as they apply those machines, um, when when they run them, the market is is changing with them, uh, which is also a difficult thing to understand when you come from traditional AI. So um, yes, it's it's just um, it, it's just some something that. It's probably a really, really hard problem to solve for AI. And I think one of the things that is really crucial when, if you want to be successful in that is to have a good understanding of the underlying economics that you are dealing with. Uh, so the flow of money um, as you apply these and so on, and not just approach it from a purely mathematical point of view. I think this is, this is quite important. And it's a lesson I had to learn as well. Um, Initially, I thought coming from computer simulations, um, oh, I just approach it you know, trading in a purely mathematical sense, and it it wasn't it wasn't good. It, it just didn't really work for me that well. And um, I I basically started instead of listening to mathematical things or or, or podcasts or something, I actually started um, really listening to a lot of economic macroeconomic podcasts, really trying to understand the underlying um, principles of the flow of money and use them uh, to inform um, my machine learning or whatever trading algorithms I have. I think this is a really important um, part of uh, automated trading systems. Mm, yeah. I, th I was just thinking back to, I saw a, a comment in one of your slides um, uh, I can't re remember the exact wording now, so I'm just going to paraphrase it. If I butcher it, you, you're welcome to tell me what it should be. It was something like um, a good traders can recognize patterns generated by machine learning and trade against them. Is that something you've said? Does that sound like a comment? Yes, in, yes. Yeah. So when I read that, I, I thought, well, how do you, how can a trader even tell the difference between a pattern that's being generated by machine learning or a pattern that's just it's just there. It's it's someone else taking a trade for any number of reasons. What do you mean by that? Traders can detect or recognize these patterns generated by machine learning. 
Well, I've actually seen this uh, happening right in front of me. It was really interesting. Um, you know, I mean, in a sense, you know, if if you if you have like really automated trading machines, a lot of them are actually fairly dumb. You know, they do things and they get better at it, but a lot of those machines are still quite basic. You know, there's there's obviously more sophisticated ones and less sophisticated ones, but. Um, I, you know, and, and you see traders that have been in the market for 20 or 30 years, and they really have this unbelievable intuitive sense of um, finding good trades. And I compare it uh, with my mom uh, looking, going through the forest and looking for mushrooms, and, and she just looks at a patch of soil and it looks like nothing. And then she just digs and there's a mushroom underneath uh, all the all the, the leaves <laughs> and, and and you wonder how how did she even how did she even uh, do this and, and and this is similar with with really really good seasoned traders they they are able to to recognize those patterns they not necessarily rationalize them but but they see them and they go ah oh, look this is a machine and it's gonna do this because I've seen it before and then they trade against it and and completely neutralize. Uh, what the machine is doing um yeah. i have i have seen this right in front of me and it's it's fascinating um so yes you know you when you when you build these machines of course you're up against um smart people like yeah. that as well yeah so it sounds like the future then or maybe it's it's even happening now to some extent is it's going to be basically machines battling machines and recognizing other patterns that are being made by other machines and vice versa so it'll be like a battle of the bots right of course i mean of course there is definitely a kind of uh, robot wars out there and and when you look also at a lot of the um research papers that come out a lot of that is about recognizing trade flow initially it was about recognizing trade flow then it was about recognizing randomized trade flow then it, it was about randomized trade flow in time and volume um, and then building basically intelligent systems that can um, recognize and pick the trade flow and effectively front run it and and then you obviously build machines that that um, build ordering algorithms that are more and more sophisticated so uh, mm. that it cannot be picked up by other machines that uh, then try to front run it. <laughs> so it's definitely a, a, a tech war and a robot war and it's becoming more and more so and it's it's quite visible in the market even especially in Australia in the last two or three years that there, there has been a big shift towards algorithms. So what do you think then that's going to do to the markets in the future, like uh, noise and efficiency, uh, you know, those type of things. What are the markets going to look like in the future, do you think? It, it's a really interesting question, and I'm pondering over this now and then because I find that fascinating. And my view on it is that it's really a little bit like evolution itself. So you see that when you have evolution, you know, you, you see those um, creatures that become more and more sophisticated more and more um, strong and powerful. But then some small creature comes along, uh, maybe even a, a bug or a virus and kills off everything. Um, well, I, I'm not an expert on evolution, but but um, uh, the way I, I can see what, what what's perhaps happening is uh, things become more and more sophisticated until something really simple comes along and and wipes out <laughs> um, all the complicated stuff again. Um, and and I, I think it's... It's probably uh, in, in, in many ways uh, very, very similar to an evolutionary process. But uh, since I'm, I'm not a biologist, I, I guess it would be interesting to actually talk to people that know more about it and see if you can, if it's possible to see any parallels between trading and biology in that sense. Yeah, that's interesting. I never actually thought of it uh, from that kind of an angle. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Oh uh, yeah, I said yeah, for definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah. Now we were having a chat the other day on uh, Skype, and you made a comment which I've written down here. I thought it was quite interesting. the The comment was that, um, something about machine learning often works better with less training data and more frequent updates, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was quite interesting. Um, can you explain a little bit about what you mean by this statement? Are you just talking about reoptimization here, or or is there more to it than that? Um, yes, it's 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 a fascinating thing because 
the common gospel is in any machine learning that more data is always better. Yeah. Um, interestingly, um, myself and, and, and quite a few of my colleagues have seen this behavior uh, and initially got quite confused about it, that you actually uh, train your uh, machine learning algorithms on less data and it's more effective. Um, I've been... I've been wondering for a while why why that why that is, and probably the best answer I, I can come up with at this point is that when you train a uh, deep learning system or whatever machine learning you have uh, on on some market data, it usually converges uh, to trade a particular strategy. Might it be a mean reverting or a momentum strategy? It, it has to respond to some type of signal. So it, it converges to that specific strategy. Now, if you, if you have a lot of data and a lot of regime, uh, regime shifts in those data, what really means is that um, a machine learning system actually gets to some degree confused and it just does stuff. It obviously makes decisions, but it doesn't make very good decisions. So... Um, it, it's it's hard to say exactly what it is because I would love to do more research on that, but I've never um, had enough time to do it as always. Um, but you you can really see when you when you run those systems, um, and and I'm not talking about reinforcement learning here. I'm talking more about systems that you train and then you release them in the market. Uh, that probably. Um, as far as we know right now, that the best way to do that is to train them on less data and retrain them again more frequently, if possible, um, in, in order to adapt to new market conditions and actually, in some sense, forget about previous market conditions. Um, there is systems that can do this to some extent as well. But they're not. I have tried a few of those, but they're not uh, quite as sophisticated yet as I would like. In, at the moment, um, you, you probably heard of a walk-forward optimization in in trading, and and so uh, you can do this with machine learning in a similar way. You you do a walk for you train it on uh, x days, months, or years of data, um, and then um, you apply it in the market for a fraction of the time that you train it on. And then um, once you move forward, you, you again retrain it on the same length and then deploy it again in the market for a certain amount of time. And yes, that seems to be a good way of doing things. So then when if, you, if you're looking at using less training data, are you saying that you're using smaller in sample periods for the walk forwards? Um, it, correctly, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's... Um, Clearly, if, if you train a AI system, um, you will produce, in some sense, um, some alpha factor, some machine learning-based alpha factor. And that is very specific uh, to the training period. And in that sense, um, once you train that alpha, uh, that alpha has a, a very strong decay. Um, and so quite... Um, for the for the um, out of sample period that that you use, you will definitely experience a really strong alpha decay. Specifically, mm -hmm. because when you train a machine learning systems, it's mostly purely mathematical. There isn't generally, uh, at least, uh, much of an economic um, rationale uh, underlying uh, the machine learning. So, uh, just from a purely I would say, mathematical point of view, the alpha decay that you're experiencing is much stronger than if there's some underlying economics uh, that you trade on. Yeah. Okay, I just want to switch gears quickly because I'm I'm conscious of our time and uh, we need to start wrapping up soon. But sure. I can't help but ask you about quantum computing because I know you've got some experience with this and um, I'm from a computing background myself. I'm fascinated with quantum computing, even though I don't know much about it. Where are we at with the technology these days um, in terms of usability and adoption and uh, perhaps general applications? Like what's happening in quantum computing these days? Um, so obviously quantum computing, um, and most people probably know that, is, is not 
quite there yet. It's probably similar to uh, where we were with computing technology in the 50s. Um, but uh, it's definitely coming. And um, um, I guess my claim to fame in this area is that I co-organized uh, the world's first quantum computing hackathon, like like a programming competition on a quantum computer, um, which was a really amazing thing to do. And, and even though I have a physics PhD, I realized uh, it's definitely a difficult thing to do. And it's nothing like uh, programming computers as we know it. So um, for all of the people who are interested, it's, it's, it's a massive challenge to wrap your head around programming quantum computers. Um, so I, I'm always fascinated by that. Um, now, in terms of what quantum computers can do, I think, interestingly, um, a lot of, of, of what is already out there, we don't really know because whilst the US has obviously made great progress, uh, there's also a huge amount going on in China and they usually keep themselves quite quiet about it. Um, I have actually... Um, um, a, a colleague and friend of mine, he he built a um, a, a system, uh, basically in theory, uh, he just wrote a paper and then apparently the Chinese took it, uh, threw a billion dollars at it and built it. And that's supposedly now the most powerful quantum computer in the world. But you don't hear much about it at all. They have never actually really published anything. So we can only guess what, what this can do. Yeah. So I think um, quantum computing is interesting. It's not going to replace normal computers, uh, but it can do certain tasks extremely well. Certain, you call them NP-hard um, um, optimization tasks. So this is stuff that computers would take, you know, infinitely long to solve. And quantum computers can do that uh, much faster. Um, and so, for example, um, Multi-time frame uh, portfolio optimization is, is one of those problems. It's, it's very difficult and with, with current computers, very hard to solve. And people are already working theoretically on uh, ways to solve that multi-time frame uh, portfolio optimization problem. Mm -hmm. And if as soon as quantum computers come along, they basically already have the algorithms uh, to do it on. So um, that's something that... Um, you know, big banks and, and people that, that have enough money to, to throw around already uh, working on. So there's, there's quite a lot of work going on building the theoretical background. Uh, and basically, once quantum computers are powerful enough, um, they will be ready to actually uh, use those. And I have no doubt that this will come in the next few years. Next few years? Wow, that's, um, Probably. that's a lot sooner than I, I thought. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there is, there's obviously a lot of debate about it, and I def definitely don't want to get into this. But <laughs> what I've heard is quantum computers already do extremely well in uh, molecular simulations. So basically solving problems like um, how can you manu or, or how can you uh, simulate uh, drugs um, on a computer, which was effectively impossible before. And now with quantum computers, you can actually start simulating um, the effectiveness of specific drugs and how you can change the molecules to make them more and more effective. And this is an area where uh, classical computers really can't keep up anymore. Um, and so there will be more and more areas like that. It just takes time. It's such a new thing. So, so people are still very much in the exploratory phase with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it might come along sooner than we think. I, I, when I was reading that article about AlphaGo uh, the other day, they said that they weren't expecting to get those kind of results for years and then uh, they did it. So, um, you know, things move fast these days and uh, you never know. It could be here quicker than we, or sooner than we think. I, I think I think often what happens is we we sort of don't follow it for a while and suddenly it's just there. <laughs> and. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised one day, you you know, you have your mobile phone and you just log on to a quantum computing server to do whatever. I, I, I don't even know. I can't even, I don't think anyone even knows yet what, what you can do with these things in the long yeah. term. Uh, just, just as in the 50s, no one could have imagined uh, that we have mobile phones and screens and all that um, and internet. And now it's, it's just normal, right? Um, and so I, I, 
I'm pretty sure it's going to be very much the same uh, trajectory with quantum computers. Mm. Uh, maybe it takes a decade or two, but ultimately it's going to come probably quicker than we imagine. Yeah. Well, that's another exciting thing to watch out for, I guess. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Now I'd just like to uh, start wrapping up now with some quick closing questions. Sure. The first one, what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Um, the biggest lesson through trading, I guess, is I, I, I guess my, my favorite mantra is if if it if it looks too good to be true true, it's generally too good to be true. So um I, I've I, I've had to go through this lesson many times. Um and it seems to be um seems to be happening over and over again. And you become, I guess, a bit, you know, a bit more relaxed and you see something looks amazing. And generally, then you go, okay, where, where did I make a mistake? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and really, really drill into it and, and become more discerning about what is actually really happening uh, in as opposed to what you see at this very moment. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So what about, do you have any favorite trading books? Um, well, I there's a few uh, books, obviously, that, that I like. Um, and um, I guess the the book that I started with when when I uh, when I started uh, building those algorithms was uh, Ernie Chan's book. Um, I, I think it's called uh, Automated Trading, or uh, it's 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 his first book. Yeah. And it's written in a language that isn't too mathematical, um, and so it's very nice to um, very nice to understand. And especially if you start out, um, I, I really recommend this book. Another great book uh, to start with is uh, Andreas Klenov, Following the Trend. Um, I really like the way uh, he thinks and he explains things. So in the book, he he has got this uh, P&L curve uh, of uh, uh, some CFA or asset manager, and he explains year by year uh, what, what's actually happening and the PNL curve looks incredibly steep upward, but then he says, "Look, you know, this year, you know, you had a thirty percent draw drawdown, for example, and it didn't look much in the grand scheme of things. But yeah. if you were in the in this, uh, you would have been pretty uneasy about it. Yeah. And 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 so this is really a nice book uh, to read. But then obviously there is a lot more um, mathematical books." Um, such as uh, Carol Alexander market models or uh, Greenold uh, active portfolio management. This is actually also a, a really nice book that I recommend. This is quite densely packed uh, with uh, maths, but for those uh, who are interested, I, I really like it. Um, as far as I know, there are not yet a lot of books on machine learning for trading. Um, perhaps this is something that, that would be interesting to see. Um, I think um, there is one or two books out there, as far as I know, um, but not not a lot. Maybe that can be your next project. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, if if there was enough time in the day, I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned Ernie Chan's book at the start of that. Uh, now I understand you're organising an event with Ernie in Sydney. Um, I think it's coming up pretty soon actually do you want to share a little bit about what that is and how people can get more information uh yes of course um it's it um it's actually a real honor to have ernie coming to australia um we bring him over here to sydney and he will uh, be running um a five-day workshop which is separated into three mini workshops one on um, machine learning and artificial intelligence for trading one on uh, automated option strategies and one on market microstructure. So um, two of them are two days. One of them is one day and they will be happening in this at the beginning of December, um, 5th to the 10th of December, uh, as far as I know. Um, so, uh, so if you would like to know more, um, you just go on uh, quantworkshops.com and it's you can find it there on the website or um yes quantworkshops.com would probably be the best um place to find it um yep, yep. 
Okay, well, I'll, I'll have a link to that on my website as well so that people Excellent. can find Thank that you. easily. And if you live outside of Australia, uh, December is a good time of year to go to Sydney. It's summertime, so you can get lots of sunshine, come for a holiday and learn from Ernie. So that's for sure. Be awesome. <laughs> beautiful beaches. <laughs> yeah, beautiful beaches. It's in Sydney, so you're only 10 or 15 minutes ride from Bondi. Bondi Beach. Correct, correct. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's very close to Bondi Beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Tom. Now, what about uh, if people wanted to get in touch with you or to learn more from you, wh- where can they go? Um, I've got a website called Triple uh, A Quants. It's my company, TripleAQuants.com. Uh, that's probably uh, the easiest. I'm also on LinkedIn. If someone wants to connect, uh, it's just uh, Dr. Tom Stark. Um, or um, I've also got uh, Twitter, Triple A Quants, uh, and Dr. Tom Stark. So um, if you would like to connect, uh, please do there. I'm also running um, regular meetup groups in Sydney. Uh, it's called Cyber Traders Sydney. It's it's a, just a meetup for uh, people who are interested in automated trading systems and it's it's all free and usually the events are really popular and we got a really good uh, bunch of people coming um so i'm really enjoying this and really sometimes very high profile speakers um i might also do a cyber traders event with ernie chan in fact so if you can't come for the um for the uh workshops uh, you might catch Ernie for free in our cyber traders events. So I keep you posted on that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. I'll have links to all of that stuff on my website as well for people who, who can't write that down at the moment. So um, Thank yeah, you. thanks. No problems. Thanks a lot for your time today, Tom. I really enjoyed our chat. Now, um, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we finish up for today? Oh, I think that that's all. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone in India. If anyone, uh, uh, listens here um india you are the greatest audience i'm really amazed by the country and um i'm really happy to be here <laughs> oh be careful picking favorites just saying of course i will be back <laughs> uh, okay well it's great to hear that you're having a good time over there as well i've heard a lot of good things about the the quant community in india and it's really um uh, really good to hear that you're over there and, and helping out as well. So, um, yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for spending time with us today, Tom. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to find value in it. So thanks again, and uh, all the best. Thanks for having me, Andrew. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's amazing. Thanks, Tom. Cheers. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.